shopping wonders that took us around the world. Next on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance and for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. Some of our most watched segments on Columbus Neighborhoods have been about shopping. And if you haven't seen it yet, check out our story on Big Bear from last season on our website. Shopping used to be a big event, a spectacle for the whole family, and that's what made it fun. Our first story is about a shopping center that took you to the seven wonders of the world. Can you imagine having the seven wonders of the world all in one place, right in the middle of a shopping center in Columbus, Ohio. Both my father and grandfather sought to develop a large shopping center on the west side of town. The site they had originally chosen for the development was the site now occupied by Westland. At the last minute, that joint venture fell apart. So they were looking for a site. They found a site that my uncle I happened to own, and they bought it from him. The problem was uh, that the original site was actually a little bit better site, and it became important to convince the anchor tenants, J.C. Penney, Gray Drugstore, they'd already committed to the other site, to relocate to the new site. So he threw this elaborate party and invited all of the tenants, and as the party went on and on and on, uh, Don, I understand, got more and more um, into the party and they said, Don, why should we come to this site instead of the other site? And he told the tenants that if they would relocate, he would build a complete replica of the wonders of the world. And uh, he wasn't that much of a drinking man, but he may have had a few uh, cocktails and whatever it was, uh, he, he sort of got ahead of himself a little bit in terms of uh, uh, promoting uh, what he would do to encourage them to go to the new site. And people had signed up, they, they had agreed to come. So they had to produce, they had to live up to what he'd said and produce the seven wonders of the world. And being a man of his word, he sought to develop the walk of wonders. So they went out and they picked their own seven wonders of the world and the wonders of the world cost as much as the shopping center itself to build. This was a really gutsy, gutsy move. And when you double the cost of building a center, then to try to make the economics work out on it, Walk of Wonders really had to generate a tremendous amount of traffic. Great Western Shopping Center opened up in the summer of 1955. They had invited everybody to this opening. There were county commissioners, there were tenants, there were officials from the city. They also invited a lady from India to stand next to the Taj Mahal. They had uh, Mayor Sensenbrenner throwing a barrel over Niagara Falls. It was quite a stage production. These were not shabby, cheesy replications. They were very carefully crafted copies of the originals. The wonders that were there were the Leaning Tower of Pisa, 
Niagara Falls, both the Canadian side and the American side. They had the Taj Mahal and the, the fountains in front of it. If you look at this photograph, you don't know you're not looking at the real Taj Mahal. They had the Grand Canyon. They actually constructed a walkway above Grand Canyon, so you could look down into it, you could see the, uh, the city and the, the hotels around Grand Canyon, you could see the water flowing. The Eiffel Tower, which I still have at, uh, at my house. They had the pyramids and the Sphinx. When you look at this photograph, I thought, well, no, that's the real thing. And it isn't. That's a photograph taken from ground level looking at the Walk of Wonders. This Parthenon looks a lot better than the one in Greece, I think, it's, which is, has seen better times. You can see that this isn't just the building of the Parthenon. This is all the ancillary buildings and the other temples that are, that are on the Acropolis. And underneath the Acropolis and the Parthenon, you could look in a window and they had Carlsbad Caverns. They had bats hanging down and they had little fans that blow the bats around a little bit and make them swing. They had built a replica of the Trevi Fountain. A lot of coins went in there and they would give all of that money to charity. You gotta remember this is 1954-55. This is before Disneyland opened up. So there was no place quite like this that, that had replicas and things like that. This is right at the time of the 707. So at this time, if they wanted to go to Europe and see any of this stuff, it was by steamship. As a school child, I was seven or eight years old, and I remember school buses full of children would take day trips to visit this. It was truly a, a wonderful educational asset to the Columbus community. It became, at night, uh, a real security problem and a hazard because of people climbing all over it. As the years went by, it deteriorated. The Ohio State fraternity boys would show up and they would pour detergent in Niagara Falls and that constantly uh, caused the need to maintain it. I think it lasted almost 10 years. This was absolutely one of a kind. I've never heard of anything like it before or after. And it, this was really unique. Bakeries are wonderful places to shop, so we sent Javier down to German Village to find handcrafted pastries and to discover how our changing tastes have made an impact on that profession. In Columbus, Pistacia Vera is definitely a dessert destination. From pastries to specialty cakes to their signature macarons, Siblings Spencer Boudros and Ann Fletcher strive to bring classical technique and artistic endeavor together. Today I'm sitting down with them in their pastry kitchen and cafe in German Village to find out how they do it. So now I gotta ask, are, are you both bakers? Or who's the baker? Spencer gets the credit for the talent okay. behind the food. I'm the baker in the, in the team. Even though we both grew up in the Columbus area, uh -huh. um, I spent 13 years um, away in Phoenix, okay. in North Scottsdale, and, okay. and went through a pastry apprenticeship, and then um, had children and wanted to move home. And, uh, Raise our babies in Columbus. Oh, absolutely. So I really, really thought that there was a demand for this type of, of dessert and pastry. Luckily, my sister, um, agreed to be my business partner, and um, and the rest is history. All right, so you're the you're the heart of the baking business, and you're the the head, the mind. <laughs> the sure, brains. I get all that right, credit right, for it. I'm the people right. I'm the people side, I guess, in the sense of taking care of. We have a staff of 43 now. There's a good energy here. Like I feel like your staff enjoys what they're doing, and they put a lot of love into the work. But it starts with you all putting love into it first, and then it and it comes from your staff as well, right? It's like, I think that we recognize, you know, the that people, that people come, come through these doors to treat themselves, and we like to treat it as such. So it's great coming to work every day and being able to work just with a great team. Awesome. Well, now, so how would you describe your, your baking style? I would say our style pays homage more than anything, just a classic French technique. Okay. A lot of our recipes <laughs> are, are uh, just have a few ingredients, but the method and the technique behind it are a couple pages long. So 
um, we're really attracted to pastry that takes care, so. Okay, wow, uh, well clearly you're passionate about pastries. Now, what did you do, Ann, to you, you know, bring the business side around uh, your brother's passion for creating these amazing pastries? No, when we look back, when we opened up in the back alley of the Short North in 2004, it's kind of that front end of the food scene. Yeah. Kind of made it up as we go along in a little bit, you know, in the sense of trying to find ourselves. Um, in 2007, we made the strategic decision to move to German Village. Just be, we loved the short north, but we were a day business. And there was something from a quality of life for us, of a commitment to stay as a cafe, get the vibe of the morning scene right. and kind of that sense of community for an afternoon coffee. Put those two pieces together of a yeah. good historic kind of vibe to the neighborhood. This is a quirky, strange building, yeah. but we've embraced it. This building definitely has some yeah. interesting architecture and so I'm sure it has an interesting history. Can you tell me about that? Um, it was originally a two-story home back in the 30s, wow. George Reiner. Um, he was the classic German bakery story. He came to America to build his bakery of windows, and it operated under his family name, Reiner's, and you'll see the signia on our Hoster side of the building, okay. um, until the 70s. And then the Plank family purchased it from the Reiner family, and Plank is a big name in the community as well. They renamed it Therns, okay. so as kids growing up, we would eat donuts and big salad sandwiches at the, at the counter at yeah. Therns. Um, and then they closed their family business um, right about the time that we were making the decision to move back. So it was super inspiring to kind of get the baking vibe back in these brick walls and completely rehab the place and really try to restore a lot of that original charm and character right, right, to what right. it was. Yeah, and you've clearly been able to maintain the spirit of what happens here in German Village. So let me ask you this, as an artist, because that's what I consider you to be an artist. Uh, um, where do you go for your inspiration? We certainly look outside of Columbus. We certainly look to Europe. We cer certainly look to the to the French masters. When it comes to the actual design of the pastry, I would say that we are we are intentionally very restrained in the way that we present our pastry. And then there's just a general seasonality too. You know, that's kind of that inspiration of okay, what feel what do you what feels good? You know, when the when there's warmth in the air. Now. Clearly, from your conversation, community is something that you all highly value. Now, how does that um, translate into the work that you do? German Village is as community as it gets. So we first start it in our home base. And then the fun part is we've got something that people love to eat. So we support things that we personally are passionate about but also really look to our customers and let them take the lead for things. So it's a win-win. It's a way to give back and saying, thanks for supporting our business. Let us help support what you're passionate about. Well, uh, thank you so much for having it. It's clear you all care about pastries and about your community. And so I think that's why you're experiencing the success that you're experiencing, because people are drawn to care. And so I appreciate you all for that. And uh, I appreciate you for sharing this, because I really care about <laughs> <laughs> digging into these pastries a little bit more. So thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>
uh, so that was, that was really neat to have the same lady do it. And then one of my favorite memories of all time was when I turned 13, my mom said that I could have my first outing alone. So I could take the bus downtown to Lazarus all by myself and I could eat lunch in the colonial room and have the, the famous celery dressing and then take the bus back home. So that was my, that's one of my favorite memories. I was working in the display department and she was working downtown as a secretary for one of the buyers and the job opened up in the display department and she took that job and that's where I met my wife. And, uh, been married now for 27 years so uh, like a lot of people I'm sure have met their spouses there. I had my uh, wedding bridal shower luncheon was here for my my bridesmaids that was when the chintz room I don't know if they called it the chintz room but it was on the south side of the store not in the location that has been for many years but just any, any celebration, Lazarus was the place to do it. My um, now husband was a assistant buyer in the basement shoe department and I met him, we dated and were married. Uh, so we met at Lazarus and fell in love. Shopping, fashion shows, live bands, celebrities. You could work up a real appetite at Lazarus. The restaurants at the store made the day downtown all that more special. Well, they were our pride and joy. Um, we had nine of them in this store over here. The main thing was that you had so many choices because there were so many restaurants on different floors. And we used to use the restaurants initially to pull people through the merchandise so that the restaurants when we first built them were in the farthest location we could find. I would walk to Lazarus, I would have lunch every day at Lazarus, not every day, but at the fountain, and I would have celery dressing and an orange drink, and it was 50 cents. And to me, that was just the ultimate. And we could come into a restaurant, and uh, for 25 cents we had this stuffing with gravy, and for a dime you got something to drink. And probably, I didn't even know about tipping, so I just put my 35 cents on the table, you know, and that was that. As a, as a child, I would, I would make money all summer, babysitting and such, and before school, before school started, even at nine or 10, I would ride the bus downtown by myself, go into Lazarus, shop and spend the money that I had that I had made and earned all summer and then decide whether I should go to the dining room for a hidden sandwich or to the west basement for a hot dog. I just always remember coming down here eating at the, the Highlander Grill which was in the basement and the chintz room and the colonial room and it was that was always fun to have the, the special things that you couldn't get any anywhere else you know, like their dressing and uh, um, their uh, ice cream uh, balls that they would roll in nuts and, and cake and stuff like that was always fun. My father worked here for many years in the restaurant department and so I pretty feel like I pretty much grew up here and um, my mom just died recently and she would have been the first person here so I kind of do this in memory of her. So we kind of felt real important coming to Lazarus, like our dad was working here. And she would um, bring all six kids of us up here, and we'd get all dressed up with the white gloves and everything and come up here and eat lunch with my dad in the colonial room. People associated with coming downtown is with eating, which is all, always a good experience, and so that, that was a happy time too. Columbus has been ranked as the number three city in the nation for fashion design, behind only New York and L.A. And this next story shows that Columbus has a long history of fashion designers, including the House of Harold. I'm 
just fine. How are you this afternoon? Great. Well, I'm trying to decide what this could be. It might be about fashion, it might be photography, or all that stuff. What's going on here? Well, mostly it, it is about fashion, I guess fashion photography. We have a collection of photography and sketches and also examples of clothing of a fashion designer who worked locally in Columbus. In He started in the late 50s and worked about 30 years until the mid-1980s. His name was H. Harold Kermode. He worked professionally as H. Harold, or he also called his designs the House of Harold. So you can kind of see H. Harold Kermode or, or House of Harold on, on some of his uh, business stationery and business cards. Over here, I have an example of one of his later designs. He went for very kind of higher end, very distinct looks. A lot of his clients would have been looking for special dresses for special events, for the holidays, definitely dressy clothing and distinct clothing. A lot of his pieces have multiple components. So there would be dresses and coats or dresses and capes. There'd be matching hats, matching scarves. He, he often made these multiple piece sets that you could wear all together or mix and match with other pieces. Um, this particular one is a later piece from the 1980s. There's a skirt that matches the jacket. The jacket had a belt. And then there's also this, this turban-like hat. And what's interesting is we noticed that there was this piece cut out of the hat and we were a little confused. But I actually, I found in the archival collections a picture of his wife who is modeling this suit and it looks like there may have been some sort of jewel on her hat that is now cut off of that. I see, I see. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, so House of Harold, was that, uh, was it a big line or is he working primarily for people in Columbus? As far as I know, he was working primarily for, for people in Columbus. It wasn't actually his full-time job. Uh, he also worked at North American Aviation for a number of years. When I saw him listed in the city directories in the 50s and early 60s, it listed him as being employed at North American Aviation. And some of his sketches, you'll see, are on the back of these computer punch cards. So I think he might have gathered those up at work and brought them home to, to sketch on. Um, because we have the sketches and the photographs, I did some work trying to match up some of the sketches with some of the actual outfits. And you know, this one, you can see the pants and then the blouse with the bow. This is a pretty dramatic one. This is from the 70s and this is a polka dot kind of animal polka dot type print, and it has a cape that oh, goes wow. with it. It's a jumpsuit mm -hmm. with a cape. It's, it's a pretty dramatic, oh, yeah. pretty dramatic look. It was definitely people who were looking for clothing you know, for special special occasions, pageants. He he did some he did some dresses for people who were in pageants. He did dresses and costumes for a lot of the local theater companies. And this is Harold, right? That is Harold himself. Yes, that that is definitely him. And his wife was in the one photograph, and this is his daughter here. Yes, right? he also did children's clothing, and again, the girls' dresses often had matching hats and coats as well. Of course, the thing about modeling the clothes is they didn't always his wife and daughter didn't always get to keep them. They would model outfits and sometimes then they would be sold and they didn't get to keep the clothes that they they wore in the pictures. I like this as sketches on graph paper too. Maybe that's uh, something they used at, at Rockwell. Here he has his signature House of Herald paper to sketch on. Here he's got computer punch cards. Here he's got graph paper. His sketches always just tend to be, you know, kind of the, the bare outlines of, of the garment. And, you know, I mentioned he worked at North American Rockwell and he this is a piece of a script from a fashion show and he was calling this the jet collection <laughs> and there was an outfit he called blast off and then there was another outfit he called the vigilante and here is his wife with the different pieces and parts of the vigilante outfit so clearly his day job was with the aviation company was influencing some of his designs these are really fun items thanks for bringing this to our attention you are very welcome Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all of our episodes on columbusneighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WSU mobile app. 
And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. And if you go down to the dark side of the train, there comes a point where the lights do start to fade. It gets broken down. Everywhere. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Wartime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. <laughs>